Hi everyone, welcome to our next lockdown special. This one is going to be on conscience. So this is your second of three ethics topics. The first was metaethics, you'll find the video on YouTube as well. This one is on conscience and fortunately again with this one, it is fairly straightforward. Why? Because it's two names we are extremely familiar with now, Aquinas and Freud. Um, also, the concept of conscience itself isn't particularly difficult. So, without further ado, let's get cracking. So, I'm just going to make myself smaller so you can see my screen. Let's make us bigger and get going. All right. Fabulous. Hopefully my uh, internet etc will keep going as normal. Uh, we are extremely windy today so it is going in and out a little bit so fingers crossed that it goes to plan. So this is the topic of conscience. Um, as we said it is Mr Thomas Aquinas uh, who is the name that you'll be talking about. He's obviously going to be your religious supporter and Freud is going to be your critic. Um, he said that conscience is the mind of man making moral judgments. Nice quote, nice and short, easy to remember and a good place to start an essay. So a good place for you to start is to basically write down everything you can remember about Aquinas from natural law, because obviously ethics and ethics, but you could also just write down what you know about him generally if you do wish to as well, because it all links and it all comes together. Um, so it's always a good place when we come to a familiar name that you recap uh, the uh, information that you are as known can remember. So he talks about, first of all, ratio. Ratio is reason and ability to make moral judgments together. Aquinas, like, uh, sorry, unlike many others, did not believe conscience was a special power or part of our mind, but linked with reason. So again, this is straight away for me a strength of his argument. He's not talking about this supernatural special power, this inkling you have. No, he's saying it's linked with reason. Why? Well, reason is a gift from God, so it's still linked with God in that way. So that's a quite good start for Aquinas, I think. Ratio distinguishes us from animals. Only humans deliberate over moral matters and therefore ratio is a fundamental part of how humans were created. So obviously we were created special amigo, dare the image of God. And so with this, we get the power of reason. Through reason, we can apply our conscience. So we are separate and different from other animals. It is an act of working things out. Ratio helps us connect to the eternal realm, to the divine truth. So if you remember your hierarchy of moral codes, so right back again to um, natural law, you had your human law, your natural law, your divine law and your eternal law. So ratio helps us to connect um, with the eternal realm. So ratio helps us get to that top one um, through that divine truth. Ratio continued then, this means morality is not just following the laws of the land or what is culturally, socially and politically normal. Um, so again, this is similar, nice synoptic link here, the idea of Jesus the rebel, so uh, Jesus, the, the person of Jesus topic, how Jesus went against what the norm was. That's what ratio supports. Ratio and our conscience supports this idea of going beyond using your own reason. Ratio reaches beyond what is socially acceptable to a higher morality. And the Pope, Pope Benedict reflects on Jesus' trial. They are shouting the same thing that everyone else is shouting. And in this way, justice is trampled underfoot. What Pope Benedict there is saying is that on Jesus' trial, when Jesus was on the, the stand and there was two others, um, Jesus... Uh, they, he, the Pontius Pilate asked the crowd what they wanted to do, what they wanted to happen to Jesus, and everyone banded together against uh, Jesus. And so what he's saying there is, is the idea that everybody went together rather than stepping out uh, uh, for, towards other people. Uh, this can be linked to many acts of social disorder where conscience can be overruled or ignored, such as the Holocaust. So again, can you think of any other examples? So what we're saying here is that when people follow the crowd, when people don't stand out or step out, then 
um, justice can be trampled, justice can be lost. Uh, and again, this can be seen in the example of the Holocaust. So um, conscience was overruled and ignored and things like the Holocaust happened. So again, yeah, can you think of any other examples, especially with what's going on in the world uh, currently, for example? Um, you have syndicates and conscientious. Now, these are words that you've probably come across in passing before. I know I did do a slide on the natural law PowerPoint. So this is more where it comes up there, rather than natural law, this is where the syndesis and conscientia belongs. So syndesis is within every human, there is a principle called syndesis. This directs us towards good and away from evil. But there is also sensuality within us, which tempts us to do evil. So a bit like the Garden of Eden and the forbidden fruit and Eve taking the apple, etc. and giving it to Adam. But worry not. Whilst both play a part in humans, Aquinas, unlike his predecessor Augustine, believed that humans lean towards goodness before evil. Now, this is a great tangent you could go down quickly, of course. Um, is this a comparison between Aquinas and Augustine? Obviously, Augustine said, um, obviously, go back to your Christian thought topic on Augustine, but obviously, he says that we're so full of original sin, that we can't, we're beyond saving, that it's God's grace alone that can help us, um, that we are just evil, that we go towards materialistic um, love and physical pleasures. So Augustine was extremely negative about um, how we behave, whereas Aquinas is saying, nah, no, we all want to go towards good. We all want to try and fight our sensualities towards good and away from evil. So Aquinas, again, is going far down the positive. Just because it's more positive and we like the sound of it more, is it accurate or is Augustine more accurate? Humans can use ratio to cultivate the habit of synderesis, so reason to cultivate synderesis, so helping you to uh, move towards good and away from evil. Basically, synderesis is the process of conscience, where one leans towards goodness, guided by ratio reason, and away from guilty pleasure. So that's synderesis. Synderesis is the process. Conscientia is what I always like to say is conscience in action. So I always remember this as conscientia. It ends in an IA, so it's conscience in action. That's how I always remember this one. Synderesis process, con conscientia, conscience in action, actually doing something about it. It is when ratio is used to inform synderesis and, and this results in acting upon conscience to do the right thing, conscientia. Now, I don't think there's a quote. Oh, yes, there is a quote there. It is clear that conscience is an act. Again, really love that quote. Of course, it's in Summer Theological, where all this material is. Um, it is clear that conscience is an act. That's a fabulous quote, because, again, it reminds you that it's about action, not just conscience itself. Now, conscience used to be on the old spec as well, and conscience on the old spec had a lot of names. You had to learn so many different names. There's a, a few of them on the last couple of slides, just in case you want to plump out your essays. But this time, with the new spec, you do not have to talk about them all. Just acquire this and Freud. And so in comparison with Aquinas, Aquinas is one of the only ones, if the only one really, that talks about action. The rest of them just talk about conscience and the process of conscience and doing the right thing, but they never actually talk about actually doing it. The actual act itself, they always talk about the process. So for me, again, this is a huge strength of Aquinas's argument that he actually talks about doing, because conscience is great, conscience is all well and good, but you have to do something about it. You have to actually use it in action. Ignorance. You must follow your ratio and conscience at all times, even if it leads to a wrong choice. By using your ratio in line with synderesis, whatever it is directing you towards is right. So you've got to use your reason in line with going towards good and away from evil, and so that you choose then the right thing in your action. However, Aquinas did recognise that mistakes can be made as sometimes knowledge is incorrect. So sensuality has educated you in the wrong way. So your reason, you think you're doing the right thing, but actually your reason has been warped by sensuality. And if you remember as well, natural law, hence why I said to go back over natural law and recap it, is your apparent and real goods. That links in with this bit. Sometimes if a mistake is based on the right to ignorance, though, you are morally blameless. Now, this is something that goes quite a lot with Aquinas' arguments, is his idea of blame. So what he's arguing is, if 
your ignorance is genuine, if your ignorance is genuine, that your reason is all correct, that you believe you're doing the right thing, then you are morally blameless. So he creates two types of ignorance. You have to know this. Vincible and invincible, not like superhero. Uh, vincible ignorance is a lack of knowledge for which you are uh, can be held responsible for. So you should have known better. So this vincible is where you could have done something better, that you have, uh, that you're ignorant, but it's based on your own fault, not through the fault of something else. This is not an excuse and you are morally culpable. So if it's vincible ignorance, so this is something where, or where you should have known better, uh, you know, uh, let me think of an example. Mm. Thinking about touching something that's hot like a fire, but that's not really an ethical situation or an ethical dilemma. Oh, I guess, for example, if you in this country supported somebody to have euthanasia, well, you're ignoring the, the, the fact that it's against the law, so you're going to get punished. So that you should have known better. You know, don't be surprised if you then get put in prison for etc. So that's kind of a should have you should have known better. So you can't use invincible ignorance as an excuse. Invincible ignorance is where you have a lack of knowledge that you're not responsible for. So, for example, if somebody goes into a hospital, you give them some medication, they have a bad response to that medication. That's not your fault. If you've checked all their notes, there's nothing in their notes about being allergic to penicillin, for example. Um, so then that is a genuine mistake. Something bad still happened. They might die, for example, but it's a genuine ignorance of something that you weren't to know about so that's what you're not responsible for the person acts in the best of their knowledge with reasonably informed information but nevertheless makes a mistake Aquinas believes that God would not then condemn such an act all right so basically conscience can be mistaken apparent goods are followed not real goods therefore conscience is fallible not perfect but conscience can be mistaken through your own fault or not. So, invincible and invincible. And so, this is Aquinas' example of invincible, um, which I have to say, this is probably one of my favourite examples ever. But we'll, so we'll see what you think to it. So, his example. If a mistaken reason bids a man to sleep with another man's wife, to do this will be evil based on ignorance of divine law he ought to know but if the misjudgment is occasioned by thinking the woman really is his own wife and she wants him then he is free from fault so basically if you sleep with another man's wife knowing it's another man's wife then you're breaking obviously the ten commandments you're breaking the divine law you're breaking what the, the pope etc says but if you've convinced yourself that that person is actually your own wife and she wants you then you're free from fault i really do think that this is clear that this was written by a monk in a monastery that was celibate i think it's a brilliant example um not not sure it's convincing towards his line of argument not sure he really posits vincible and invincible correctly but this is the example you can use the other great thing about this example whilst you don't have to mix conscience topic with sex ethics they don't cross Aquinas obviously pops up in sex ethics use this example in sex ethics because there's a whole area of sex ethics on adultery this is basically justifying adultery that you're allowed to be an adulteress as long as you are mistaken in thinking that they're your own wife. So the evaluation of Aquinas, as we know, he is highly influential. He's supported by the Catholic Church. From the Catechism of the Catholic Church, he says that conscience formulates its judgments according to reason. It's always brilliant to quote a pope or the Catechism or something like that in an essay. It really does just show those links between uh, natural law Aquinas with the Catholic Church. And obviously, as I've said previously, the Catholic Church is the one of the most powerful, if not the most powerful institution in the whole world one of the richest institutions in the whole world it has its own postcode the vatican city is that big yet one little monk wrote some ideas down 
and the Catholic Church took them. I think that's pretty amazing. I think that's pretty fantastic that he was able to influence such a powerful institution, just one person. So for me, I think that that really is a huge strength for Aquinas' argument that it was so influential. It explains why conscience can sometimes be incorrect. Again, Aquinas is one of the only ones that recognises this and explains why. Um, Augustine, um, a, a lot of the others that we'll, we'll look at on the last couple of slides quickly, none of them really mention why we can get it wrong. Aquinas does, so that's something to recognise. Um, clear set authority and guidance because it's supported by the Bible, your divine law. Everyone can experience reason, included knowledge and reasoning as well as religion. So again, he's combined the two. He's combined reason and logic so that atheists can follow this as well with religion. God's given you that and you can use it. So this again is open to anybody. So even if you don't believe in God, you don't believe in, um, you know, the church or the divine law or eternal law or any of that, you can still believe in conscience. You can still believe in reason to support your conscience and the actions that you take. To continue, though, some acts can never be morally blameless, so acts may still break the law in title punishment, hence my euthanasia example, regardless of right intention or following conscience. It assumes good and evil are the same for everyone. So again, he says that we have one, one thing that we follow, the synderesis rule, do good and avoid evil, that we all go towards good away from evil, but Evil and goodness are subjective. They're very culture bound. So again, this idea that one rule for all doesn't really work. I think he's, I think it's Kai Nielsen in the Natural Law PowerPoint. So do check out the Natural Law video. He's the one that said that right and um, good and evil are not the same for everyone, and that they again they are uh, culturally subjective. So do check that out because it's a good name to bring in here. Um, what happens if you don't believe in God? I think Aquinas gets around that, but still, it's still a religious theory. Are you really going to follow it that much? It assumes there is no emotion expressed. There's, is there a little bit more needed in ethics? Is there a little bit more recognition of your emotions? It assumes that we are all rational. Um, can conscience conflict with reason? So one of the activities I want you to do on the, the Padler is to actually have a look at this idea. What happens if what your reason is telling you and then your conscience is telling you is two completely different things? Um, so, for example, if you saw somebody um, drowning in a pond or a river or the sea or something like that, your reason will maybe be saying, um, you know, you're not a very strong swimmer. Um, is there anybody else that can help them? Are you really the right person to do it? Your conscience will be going, God, you've got to save that person. You know, what happens if they die and you've, you've not done anything to intervene? So again, the, what happens if they conflict? Does, is conscience really that well linked to reason? Right. Sigmund Freud time. We all love a bit of Freud, even in lockdown. So Sigmund Freud, there he is looking all innocent. Please do not get bogged down in your psychoanalysis uh, information and your uh, five psychosexual stages. We're going to do a very quick recap now, but you do not have to get bogged down because this essay is on conscience, not Freud, don't forget. Um, his theory of the mind psychoanalysis, it provides an alternative account of conscience in his books, an outline of uh, psychoanalysis and the ego and the id. Every person goes through five psychosexual stages. Before we get to them, I will hold you in anticipation because you know what's coming next. I can't believe I have to record myself going through these. Um, is to go back to psychoanalysis. Psychoanalysis is still what we use today. To come lie on my couch and tell me your problems while someone writes it down and analyzes what's going on in your psycho, your brain, your mind. This is still the technique used today. So that again is something to recognize. Freud has many faults. Uh, aside from the fact he was a avid smoker of uh, uh, smoker snorter of cocaine, so he pretty much stuck whatever he could find up his nose. Um, psychoanalysis is still used today. It is extremely recognised, and he is one of the most influential psychologists of all time. So please feel free to take his arguments with a pinch of salt. Feel free to criticise him, but please recognise that a lot of his arguments are still very, very important. All right, it's time. So, every person goes through five psychosexual stages. Oral, anal, 
phallic, crucial for the development of the superego. This is the Oedipus and Alexa complexes. Latency and genital. So, very quickly. Oral, not to one. This is where everything, all pleasure is focused on the mouth. This is why babies put everything in their mouths. Um, they have dummies. They have chewy toys. Chances are it's because they might begin teeth. But for Freud, this is the oral stage. If you are over or understimulated in the oral stage, you will then later get adult fixations. Um, basically, again, things to do with your mouth, like smoking, uh, nail biting, um, chewing pens, anything like that. The second is the anal stage, ages one to three. This is where you enjoy the pleasure of your bowel movements, basically. This is where you enjoy that control. So some of you might have younger siblings or nieces and nephews and you'll be all ready to go out and you'll say to them, do you want to go to the bathroom? No, 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 no. Do you need the toilet? Go to the toilet, don't need it. No, 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 no. You then leave the front door, sit in the car, I need the toilet. This is that control. They enjoy the control over the bowel movements. Phallic stage. Freud was obviously focused on male development rather than female. The electric complex came afterwards as an afterthought. This is all based on the little hands uh, research that he did. Basically, you can Wikipedia the details of this later. Um, little hands, uh, his mother used to be in contact with Freud. So Freud used to help his mother. One day, little hands was in the bath and uh, he asked his mummy to touch him there because he liked it. Obviously, his mother freaked out, told Freud. And from this, Freud thought, hmm, all little boys are sexually in love with their mothers. So from this, he developed the phallic or the Oedipus complex. Basically, all little boys sexually love their mothers and want to have sex with them. This is not a um, a, a, a love like a, a child's love for a parent and a parent's love for a child. No, this is an actual wanting to have sex with their mother. And so what the child then realises is that mum loves dad, uh, uh, but dad is far bigger and stronger. So if he recognises the boy's love for the mother, his fear is that he'll get castrated. And so what he does is he starts to copy the father and do his mannerisms and want to be around the father all the time because he thinks well mummy loves daddy so therefore mummy might love me the same as she loves daddy if I'm like dad and I copy dad and what happens is they start to socially develop and adapt and become like the the same sex so they become like their father they take on their mannerisms etc etc and eventually that love of the mother gets buried deep 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 down in the, the iceberg again we're coming to the iceberg in a second deep 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 down in their um in their unconscious mind so deep that you will never ever reach that love so again freud's got a, a good cop out there how can none of us remember it oh it's so far down in your unconscious mind you're never going to and um, that he then forgets the love of the mother and continues into the next stage of his development uh, between five to six and puberty nothing happens nice calm before the storm genital puberty to maturity is exactly as it sounds you focus on your genitals wow each stage is associated with a particular part of the body this is because the libido your sexual desire focuses on that part of the body as it's a source of pleasure frustration or both right moving on quickly. There are three aspects of the human personality, the id, ego and superego. The id is entirely unconscious. This is part of the mind present from birth. It's the central component of your personality. Powerful, instinctive and primitive, driven by pleasure. It seeks immediate gratification. Basically, it's the I want, I want, I want. I need, I need, I need and I need it now. So this is very much the spoilt child idea. So the id is right from birth. Um, and this is why, um, you know, yes, babies cry in order to get food or get changed or nourishment, etc, etc. But it's also a, I need your attention now. That's why babies cry like they do, because they this is not something that you can ignore. Uh, I always think of uh, Veruca Salt. Salt. 
Uh, it's a long time since I've seen uh, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, but she is very much the id character. Your ego is basically this idea that because it's not socially acceptable to seek immediate gratification for all your desires, I want ice cream for tea, no, that's not acceptable, children therefore learn to keep them in check. This is through the teachings of parents and wider society. Thus, what is socially and not socially acceptable. This develops into ways to satisfy your desires, but that are more acceptable. The ego mediates the desires versus social ac acceptability. I want ice cream, so I'll eat my greens first and then I'll have ice cream afterwards. It is the reality principle. So, for example, uh, a horse is the id, the rider is the ego. This, of course, is Freud's example. He always has examples with animals. Um, a horse is the id and the rider is the ego. Um, and it's the idea that the ego is in control of the id. That's what that means. Good conscience. This, obviously, this is all about conscience. This is why we're linking this to here. Good conscience is effective operation of your ego over the id so this is effective operation of your ego over the uh, the pleasure principle where desires are achieved uh, so for example devouring a chocolate cake whilst avoiding punishment from social authorities uh, or maybe weight watchers you can tell i've started my uh, diet last week first week of lockdown and decided to go on my new health kick yeah, it's the, the pain is real. The struggle is real. So, um, yes, all my examples now will probably be food related. The superego, the final part, then this is the ego ideal. This is the last part of our human psyche to develop around the age of five. It stores all of our internalised moral standards of right and wrong acquired from parents and society. So obviously five, you're going through the, the Oedipus complex, the phallic stage. So, again, that's where you're relating to your father. Based on behaviourism, basically, when you are rewarded, you bank this in your superego as a good act and vice versa. So behaviourism, have a look and check out Skinner again with his salivating dogs and his rats and his pigeons and stuff. Um, but this is basically the idea that when you are rewarded, positively reinforced in some way, you're likely to do it again. So you bank that in your superego as a must do next time. If you're not rewarded or ignored, you bank it as, yeah, don't bother. The superego stops us from breaking rules because of the fear of receiving punishment, criticism or the feelings of guilt. Now, this is quite interesting, really, because what Freud is saying there, because a lot of people don't do bad things uh, because they just fear punishment or they fear criticism from society. But Freud also mentions guilt. That's something far more personal, that you don't do something because you not because you feared about punishment, not because you're feared of criticism, but actually because you fear your own self-judgment you fear your own feelings of guilt so when we talk about conscience we are not discerning the moral thing to do we are simply feeling guilt because of the superego so it's this idea that it's not doing what you think is the right thing to do you're just your conscience is basically avoiding the feelings of guilt so your superego has basically banked a manual of what to do or not do and when you do something wrong it's basically because you feel guilty um, that is created by your superego freud saw conscience as an act of the superego it observes the ego gives it orders judges and threatens it with punishment exactly like the parents whose place it has taken i love that quote from freud it's a bit of a long one so what i would do in an essay is i would take little bits of it so even um judges and threat judges it and threatens it brilliant what we've got five words there that's enough of a quote and then you can just paraphrase around the rest of it or observes the ego you could just do gives it orders. It's, it's totally up to you how you wish to use quotes. You don't have to use a whole quote. Um, you can also do, um, obviously, your three dots, which means you've removed something. So you could do observes or gives it orders, exactly like the parents use, and just do some dots in between if you wanted to. It's totally your choice when it comes to your essays. Um, but what he's saying is, is the super ego replaces that parental judgment. Obviously, you've still got the parental judgment, you've still got the fear of society, etc. But um, this is what, judges you this is what threatens that potential punishment and that punishment might just be those internal feelings of guilt 
iceberg, you're all very familiar with this, the ego, the super ego, and then the unconscious mind, which is where your id is found. Obviously, uh, the pre-conscious is what comes into dreams, etc. You must conform to behavioral expectations from the super ego. Deep down is the uh, son's love for the mother. Um, conscience is built on this guilt of disappointing parents. Uh, and morality, therefore, is from your human conscience, not God. Um, sorry, I'll just go back, is from your conscience, not God. Um, so what you need to be able to compare, compare Freud with Aquinas. So one focuses on the idea that it comes from God, even just through reason. The other is basically the guilt, uh, and that guilt is of disappointing parents. Don't worry about the picture of the Simpsons at the bottom. I used to do a video where Bart fell in love with Marge, etc. Um, just in case you're wondering what on earth they're there for. Um, just to go back as well, just for the superego, um, one strength as it will come up on a slide, I am guessing, uh, in a couple of moments time but one massive strength of this is that or certainly well, it doesn't have to be a massive strength but it's something that I want you to recognize um, id ego super ego is very very much like Plato's three parts of the soul um, your repetitive spirited and rational this idea that the charioteer the one in control of the two so your um your repetitive is very much your id. This idea of what, what, what need, need, need physical pleasures, uh, those appetitive appetites of the body. You've got your um, uh, uh, rational that's in charge, like your superego. Um, and then you've got your ego, which is your um, spirited. So it's a nice link there. Obviously, the reason why I said it doesn't have to be a strength is because it depends if you think there's any value to Plato. But it's nice to see that Plato's information um, on, and ideas are used thousands of years later by a recognised uh, scientist. So Freud, don't forget, is a scientist because obviously psychology is a recognised science. Strengths of Sigmund Freud, he is the founder of psychoanalysis, still used today, I've explained that. Fundamental in the development of dreams, the mind, and the conscious, subconscious, and unconscious. Clear that parents and environment do affect our morals and ethical ideas. That, again, I think is very important. He recognises the importance of parents and how these do affect our morals. He recognises the importance of childhood and how uh, the role of parents in your moral development Explains why all our morals are so different because they are affected over time, culture, society. Um, so there's a lot of really big strengths there. Obviously, Aquinas doesn't really recognise why our morals are so different because he says we all do good and avoid evil. Whereas Freud does recognise actually your morals are different because of your parents, your society, your upbringing, uh, etc. Weaknesses, it's unethical and unscientific just to carry out a study that everybody is like little hands. What about children from uh, single parent families or modern families? I call them modern families, but, but basically I'm meaning like your multi-layered families. So step families, uh, uh, you know, gay couples, for example. So uh, single parents, as we've said. So this idea of Freud would imply that they're immoral, that their children will grow up immoral. So if you have two dads, uh, that it would, because you and you're a female, for example, that you can't then um, go through your electrocomplex properly and relate to a woman so therefore you will be, grow up immoral which is completely illogical Freud obviously grew up in a society where it was male female with you know the 2.4 children you know dad and mum with children society now is far more complicated than that what happens if parents are immoral so if your parents are immoral Freud's argument would imply that you would then get their morality so you would become immoral does this mean parents can be held responsible if their children are immoral? If your children do something wrong, does that mean you're responsible because they've learned things from you? Seems very, very unfair. Ignores later life experiences. Yeah, what happens? So the final stage, your um, super ego develops around the age of five. Well, what happens later on in life? I'm sure that affects your conscience. And finally, is conscience morality unconscious? What about free will? Do we have no control over what we do? So the final section, hmm. cold tea, too much talking. The final section is then guilt. Guilt is the internal conflict in the mind, the struggle between what you desire and what you feel you should or should not do. Interestingly for Freud, it is this inner turmoil or guilt that can lead people to doing bad things. It is not therefore a consequence of wrongdoing, but a cause of future wrongdoings. 
For Aquinas, on the other hand, it's God's grace that banishes guilt from a person. So again, you need to think about, do either of these ideas work? So Freud's coming at it from a different angle and saying that these feelings of guilt actually can lead you to doing wrong things rather than wrong things leading to guilt. Whereas Aquinas says, again, this is God's grace that takes guilt away from you. Hence, again, like the confession, you confess your sins, God takes that away. Do either work, though? Do you think that's what guilt is? Right, so... Something that the exam board are expecting you to be able to know and talk about is um, how it links, how this idea of guilt can be applied. So that it's an important section is Freud and Aquinas' views on guilt. So I think a really good example to be able to use for this is the Adam and Eve example, an example that you know very well from topics like Problem of Evil. Um, and so I, what I would like you to do, please, is to explain how Aquinas and Freud would explain Adam and Eve, the apple in the Garden of Eden. So how would Aquinas' syndesis, conscientia, um, recta ratio, right reason, how would all that link? How would divine law link? How, If it can link, how, because obviously that comes later after the Adam and Eve, how does, what would Freud say about it? What would Freud say about, um, you know, the unconscious mind? How would Freud link the id ego, super ego, etc, etc. So this is a really good example and I think you can make a lot of links to what we've just done with this concept. Right, last two slides then. These are your extra names. They're extras because you do not have to learn them anymore. What you can do though is you can add them into your essays as a plumper. So these plump out your essays. The religious views on conscience, you have Augustine, Butler and Newman. They used to be on the old spec, uh, whereas, as I've said, they're not uh, anymore. Augustine says the voice of God considered seriously. You see God as your witness and people are able to sense right and wrong because God reveals it to us personally. And for me, there is a number, one of the activities I'd like you to do, or certainly um, before you use them in an essay, don't just write it like that. Evaluate them. I think there is an awful lot of problems or questions that come from those four bullet points there so for example this is the voice of god can you ignore it can you turn it off this seems to question our free will if god's constantly talking to you uh, does everybody hear the voice of god is it the same voice of god but then why do people do things differently so there's there's so many questions and problems with those four that i would really like you to think about if you're going to use augustine in your essay Butler says so it's an essential part of being human, separates us from animals. Like Aquinas, it is what we use to judge an action, good or bad, automatic and authoritative. It exerts itself spontaneously, so it happens without being even consulted. It's, fi it's a final say in moral choices. God-given guide should always be followed, and it's our natural guide, the guide decided to us by the author of our nature. Now, for Butler... Obviously, take your time writing this all this down. Don't don't rush through it like I am. Um, but Butler, I think, is very relevant if you want to do it as a comparison with Aquinas. I wouldn't do a paragraph on Butler. I wouldn't do a large spiel on Butler. I would just do it like I have there, the third bullet point down. I would do very quick comparisons and similarities. Um, so that's a good way of dropping him in. You don't have to introduce him. You don't have to write loads about him. You could just say, like Aquinas, Joseph Butler also uh, agrees that a conscience is what we use to judge an action, good or bad. This is convincing because this works because this is illogical because again your comparison to butler is not evaluation that is still just description butler does agree with aquinas you're just stating a fact there that's not evaluation the evaluation comes in when you say what this does for the argument does this make it convincing or not um a few questions again come up with this automatic and authoritative automatic happens without being asked or happens again without being consulted free will what happens if you don't want it do atheists then not have this or do they put earplugs in their part of their conscience that they then don't hear it from god but then if they're not hearing it from god does that mean then that people that are atheists are immoral that doesn't really make sense so again there's a lot of questions that come about from butler John Henry Newman, he says that we know what is right and wrong through illative sense. I like that idea. Illative sense basically is guilt. So really nice thing to Freud and Aquinas there. 
Rather than through reason and conditioning, our voice is the voice of the lawgiver and it's a messenger from God, a bit like the Holy Spirit idea. Um, voice of the lawgiver, again, this idea of a voice. Can you turn the voice on and off? What happens if you don't hear the voice? Um, but I do like this comparison there with Aquinas. He says that it's um, not through reason. So Aquinas says it is through reasoning. Who's got a better argument? Is it reason? Is it not reason? Finally, non-religious views of Aquinas, um, non-religious views of Aquinas, non-religious views of conscience. Um, you have Jean Piaget and Fromm. Um, now, I really miss not doing these two. Um, I really like Piaget and Fromm. Piaget, you may have studied him in sociology, if any of you do health and social care, if any of you do child development, child care, anything like that, you probably will have come across Piaget. Maybe in psychology, because he is a developmental psychologist, but it depends if you do anything to do with children. Uh, but he has one of the most comprehensive theories of intellectual cognitive uh, developmental psychology very very influential man he proposed a universal series of stages throughout childhood no not freud like don't panic um, he studied how children interact by playing a game of marbles obviously with, with kind of setting the time here that children played with marbles he looked at and recognised that there are two different stages of morality, heteronymous and autonomous. Heteronymous is between the ages of five and nine, so obviously mainly your primary school years. Child looks beyond itself for moral authority. They basically want to be told what to do. Um, rules must be obeyed, rules set down by higher authority, and its immoral uh, acts are therefore uh, punished. Whereas autonomous is more a personal code. Um, of conduct develops based on social uh, perceptions and punishments in proportion with the actions so there's an awful lot of information there um a lot of questions as well this you know it's, even though it is one of the most comprehensive guides doesn't mean it's not without its faults so for example what happens between nine and ten so do you wake up one morning at ten and go oh autonomous no, probably not that uh, specific. Um, he does say that moral cells have a mixture of the two, though, where you look beyond authority, um, that you think everything immoral should be punished. So this is the idea. I don't know if any of you have ever done school attachment or have younger siblings or have been to a children's um, uh, a child's party or anything like that. But this is very much the whenever a child, they're always tattletailing. So children will always run to you and go, oh, they've flicked me. Oh, they've pinched my pen. Oh, they've done this. They've done this. That's heteronymous. For them, they think the fact that they got flicked as immoral as Murder, obviously children don't know about murder, but what I'm meaning is that their views are so overinflated that if it's wrong, it's, oh, you've done something wrong. Whereas, obviously, as an adult, you think, you know, someone's flicked you, obviously. You, you know, if you're friends, if you do that to a stranger, it's probably not going to be good. But if if you if you take um, somebody's pen by mistake and things like that, it's, it's, not, it's not as bad as what a child thinks it is. Um... Whereas autonomous is when you, your punishments are in proportion with the actions. So you know that um, the punishments, so if you stole a pen or you stole a car, the punishments are going to be in proportion with what you've done. From so cute, so cute. He influ He believes that we are influenced by external authority, parents, teachers and church leaders, no mention of God, um, rules internalised by your person. So, uh, so again, this is quite Freud-like, you could link it to Freud, but he does, uh, well, I guess God is mentioned with the church leaders, so you could do a bit of both there, really. Uh, I think Fromm links in very, very nicely because he's got the parents, teachers like Freud, but he's got the church leaders like the divine law for Aquinas. Um, rules are taken on board by the person disobedience so doing not as you're told causes you to feel guilt that then weakens you and makes you have a lesser power and then you become submissive to that authority and the reason why from i think is so good in his argument is he's talking about personal experience he saw this happen in nazi germany uh, in the, by the nazi government he saw this exact thing happen that people took on uh, um, what authority was saying to them so what the nazis were saying they internalized that and then when they disobeyed it they then felt 
felt guilty. So they became more and more submissive to what Nazis were saying. That's, I mean, the Nazis didn't just create concentration camps and kill millions of people like that. This was a 10 year psychological development. This was 10 years of people internalizing things and being brought up with it, going to school at five and, 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 and ridiculing and, uh, Jewish people etc um, and children's books so this is from a very very young age and so then breaking that you felt guilt because you were disobedient and this is something that you couldn't necessarily control which is a worrying thing about Fromm's argument this is the authoritarian conscience he had, however he did develop uh, later his idea of a human a humanistic uh, approach which is far healthier it gives you far more control over your behavior so maybe from got to a point where the idea of an authoritarian conscience was too worrying that authority can control and manipulate you so much that that actually is quite a worrying standpoint so he did later change to the humanistic however just because it's a worrying perspective doesn't mean it's a wrong perspective, maybe. He says it's our real self and it leads to reaching our full potential. And that is conscience for you folks. So, as I've said, you need to know Aquinas, you need to know Freud, you need to know guilt. The last two slides are extras, they're essay plumpers. Please do not use these though unless you are going to use them in relation to Freud or Aquinas, otherwise you'll lose marks and obviously evaluate them. Just dropping in a name, don't name dump. Don't drop in a name without doing something with it. Um, I always think it's such a waste when students have remembered names and used names but then lose that mark or lose that impact by not then doing anything with that name you have to evaluate it that's the easy bit evaluate it you're using them for a reason and is it because they're good or is it because they're bad is it they're convincing or not so hopefully you found this video useful um if you do have any questions of course pop them underneath uh underneath this go across to the blog check out the other details on there and um, what i'll also do is i will be emailing my class uh work etc and your, your your sheets that you can use to go through this but this pretty much does capture the whole topic this is pretty much everything that you need to know. You need to pick a side as well. Are you Freud or are you Aquinas? Please don't just pick Freud because you don't believe in God and therefore you're not going to follow Aquinas. That's very shallow. That's a shallow argument. No, really think about what you like about their arguments, what works about their arguments and go from there. Otherwise, thank you very much, everybody. Your video um, next week will be sex ethics. So this is when we start sex ethics. It may be the end of next week, though, because obviously we do need to recap your four AS topics first before going down the sex ethics route. Uh, but you have plenty of things there to support you with revising and going over them as well. Right. Thank you very much, everybody. Uh, on to situation ethics video for me now. So I'm just going to make you smaller. Thanks, guys. Bye for now.